organic, unpredictable, unknown, lovely, beautiful, a sense of fulfillment. This is part of the pleasures of life and not the chores of life. And coming up tonight on Daily Iowan TV. It's that time of year again, homecoming week. We've got the whole breakdown of events. And the first event of the week kicked off this morning. Find out what coming up. Iowa football comes out on top once again. We give you the breakdown on how they got past their first Big Ten matchup. All that and more coming up. Daily Iowa TV starts now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Cole Johnson. And I'm Kelsey Stanger. When the corn statue appears on the Pentecrest, you know it's homecoming week. There are tons of events going on this week, so let's break them down for you. Monday starts the week of service with the annual blood drive at the IMU. Wednesday is sports night at the Hall of Fame where community members can meet and greet, get autographs from Hawkeye student athletes. Thursday night is Iowa Shout and Friday is the biggest night of all. Starting with the homecoming parade downtown at 545, but don't leave too soon. The coronation of homecoming king and queen is after the parade on the Pentecost, followed by a free concert from churches. The week's festivities all lead up to the big game inside Kinnick Stadium on Saturday against Illinois starting at 11. For more information on all the week's events, check out homecoming.uiowa.edu. This weekend, Carver was packed with something other than Hawkeye athletics. Daily Iowa reporter Taylor Smith covered the event. This Saturday, the University of Iowa had the chance to meet the world's funniest man, no other than Kevin Hart. You've seen him on numerous Netflix and Comedy Central shows, but on Saturday, students had the chance to see him live in Carver Arena. The Campus Activities Board, better known as CAB, hosted the event. We're always trying to scope out the biggest talent. Um, it was kind of a dream to get Kevin Hart here, and somehow we made it happen. We reached out and we talked to a lot of different people. There's a whole chain of command, kind of, and we finally got him. And I would say that, yeah, we're just trying to get the best talent for the university. For a man that is an American actor, comedian, and producer, exactly how much money went into getting him to Iowa? A lot. First day of ticket sales, I believe we sold 6,500-ish tickets, which is pretty insane. There are two tiers for tickets, so it's $25 and then $35. So the first tier was $25, and there were 3,000 of those. Carver Hawkeye Arena holds about 15,000 people. Of that 15,000, Kevin Hart took up 9,000 seats. In other words, the event was very successful. Taylor Smith, Daily Iowan TV. This fall, there always seems to be something happening in Hubbard Park. Sunday, Hubbard was host to the taste from all over the world. This Sunday afternoon in Hubbard Park, students and community members gathered together to celebrate different cultures. Today is the 25th Celebrating Cultural Diversity Festival, um, which has a long tradition on this campus of highlighting and really promoting the uh, vast array of diversity that we have in our campus and Iowa City community. 25 years ago there really wasn't an opportunity for um, folks to come together and really look at the diverse ways that we have community here in Iowa City, um, but over the last you know, 15 or 20 years we've seen a really big increase in particularly student-run events that celebrate um, specific cultural traditions. From Malaysia culture uh, we have we are a multicultural uh, country, so we have primarily the, the Malay, the Chinese, and the Indian. So food is actually part of our culture. It's a very, very popular culture in our country. Although this will be the last year Iowa will be having a multicultural event, individual cultural events will still continue to happen throughout the year. Taylor Smith, Daily Iowa TV. An Iowa City annual tradition, Brewfest, took over the streets of downtown Iowa City this weekend. <laughs> Daily Iowa TV reporter Yezi Shen went to check it out. The Northside Oktoberfest takes over the streets of the Northside, just block north of downtown Iowa City to celebrate the 20th year of downtown Iowa City Brewfest. They have over 500 beers from around the block to around the world. The 20th annual Iowa City Brewfest takes place this Saturday, November 3rd. The Brewfest can be traced back to 1883. After more than a hundred years, there are over 500 beers from around the block to around the world be available for tasting in what is being hyped as the biggest brew fest to date. 
I like coming down here uh, because I like to try beer from all the different places. People come from all over the country, mostly the Midwest, and it's fun to try all the different beers that they have here. This is Ye Zishen reporting from Daily Iowan TV. Well, that festival looked like a hit, and it looked like they had really great weather. It sure did, Cole. Well, let's send it over to Casey Lindekrantz in the weather studio to tell us what we can expect for this upcoming week. Casey? Thanks, guys. It's certainly been a cool and cloudy week out lately, but you can expect temperatures to rise a bit. Monday morning is looking to be a cool 54 degrees and mostly cloudy. When the afternoon rolls around, it's going to be around 67, and the cloudy weather will persist. Continuing into the night, temperatures will drop into the upper 50s. Tuesday and Wednesday look to warm up slightly, hitting the mid to upper 70s with lows in the 50s and 60s. There's a good chance of rain Thursday, and you can expect mid-70 highs and low 50 lows. To round out the week, Friday and Saturday will both likely be in the mid-60s with partly cloudy skies. Well, guys, that's all I got in the weather studio. Back to you guys at the desk. Even though we've had amazing fall weather this weekend, residents on the East Coast weren't so lucky. Torrential rain and wind lasted for days, largely because of Hurricane Joaquin. Even though most of the rain has stopped, coastal states like Virginia, North and South Carolina are still feeling the effects of the storm, with large-scale flooding filling steady streets. The National Weather Service said that the East Coast will continue to experience catastrophic flooding leading into the week. President Obama declared South Carolina a state of emergency and ordered federal, excuse me, ordered federal aid to help those in the disaster areas. I've heard a lot about that, and that is just awful what's going on over there. Well, hopefully we have some better news at the sports studio. Let's toss it over to them to you caught up on everything black and gold. Thanks, guys. We are in the thick of fall athletics, specifically football, and this weekend gave the team a win to remember. Iowa took down Wisconsin on the Badgers' home turf, making the Hawkeyes 5-0 on the season. Getting the W was the main highlight of the weekend, but it also gave Iowa a little extra bonus. We are now ranked 22nd in the polls because of the victory, and Iowa hopes to keep climbing the ladder as the season continues. Football reporter Laura Bulanda gives us the highlights from the tough-fought game that put Iowa on top. In a low-scoring, defensive, heavy game between the Hawkeyes and the Badgers on Saturday, the Hawkeyes came out on top in Camp Randall Stadium for the first time since 2009. Wisconsin received the ball and dedicated its first drive mostly to Joel Stave's arm. After a clutch pass breakup by Desmond King on third and five, kicker Rafael Gaglioni kicked a 46-yard field goal to put the Badgers on top, 3-0. to zero. In Iowa's first drive, Kanziri was stopped for a loss of two yards, and on third and seven, a 21-yard pass to Matt Vandenberg puts the Hawkeyes on the Wisconsin 48. A few run plays later, they found themselves on the eight-yard line, fourth and two, but a pass to Henry Krieger Cobalt just doesn't get there. Moving on to the second quarter, the score still 3 to 0. Wisconsin takes the ball downfield to set kicker Gaglioni up for a 42 yard field goal, but it's no good. In the next Iowa drive, Bethard's pass is intercepted by linebacker TJ Edwards, but a personal foul penalty on Jesse Hayes puts the Hawks 15 yards ahead with a first down. At the end of the drive, Kane came in to kick a 27 yard field goal but the wind got the best of him and it was no good. Wisconsin's next drive ended quickly with an interception by Desmond King. Iowa capitalized on the opportunity, putting a quick seven points on the board with a touchdown pass to tight end George Kittle. With just two minutes and 59 seconds left in the second quarter, Stave was sacked by Drew Ott, causing a fumble recovered by Iowa's Nate Meyer. This gave Kane a chance to redeem himself with a 33 yard field goal. The score at half, 10 to 3. In Wisconsin's first drive of the third quarter, Stave threw another interception to Desmond King on the Iowa 11 yard line. Iowa came back with a couple of pass completions to Matt Vandenberg, who went 6 for 6 on the day. But it wasn't enough as Bethard throws a pick to safety Michael Caputo. This set the Badgers up for a solid rushing drive to kick a 46 yard field goal. The score now 10 to 6. In the fourth quarter, both teams fought back and forth pretty evenly, but it was Iowa's defense who came out on top to stop Wisconsin on the Iowa 16 yard line. The final score of the game 10 to 6, with Iowa holding a 5 0 record and the Heartland Trophy. Reporting inside Camp Randall Stadium, this has been Laura Belanda with Daily Iowan TV Sports. Now, anyone could tell that this wasn't an easy game for Iowa to win, and the defense was definitely something to talk about.
But football reporter Taylor Brooks tells us how the offense managed to pull in their end of the bargain and get into the end zone. When Iowa came into Camp Randall Stadium on Saturday, they knew that Wisconsin's defense was going to be a battle that they haven't experienced so far yet this season. And when quarterback CJ Beathard was feeling the pressure, something had to give. And surely enough, Iowa found ways to score. One player from Wisconsin's defense was harder to contain than most. Outside linebacker Joe Schobert showed no fear when adding pressure to Iowa's man in the pocket. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, he's, to me, he played like that last year. And uh, I'll go back you know, two years, but last year I thought he was a great football player. And uh, he's playing really high level right now. He's done it every week out there. Quarterback C.J. Beathard may have not been able to rush like he usually can, but he kept his poise when he had the ball in his hands and even when the ball wasn't in his hands. Yeah, when I'm coming out of the pocket, that's just something quarterbacks have to, you know, when you're running, you really want to secure the ball, so it'll be a great learning experience. Bethard was sacked twice against Wisconsin and threw one interception, but somehow the quarterback and his offense scored points when it counted. You know, we're impressed with, uh, you know, what we've done so far and continue to improve. And you know, we'll look at the film and, you know, correct some mistakes because we didn't play as clean as we wanted to. The run game has been important in the past four weeks, but in week five against a monster defense and a ranked opponent, Jordan Kanziri shined yet again, but this time on short gains. The fact that we can get certain things done and uh, just the fact that our offense has worked the way it has and prove that it can get certain things, situations like that done. The average per rush for Iowa was 3.6 yards, but Kanziri had the ball in his hands 26 times with 128 total yards. Jordan's been playing well every, each and every uh, uh, week. Even though Kanziri didn't have a touchdown against Wisconsin, Iowa managed to score on a Wisconsin team that hadn't let their opponent get a touchdown in three games. It's just the work that we've put in and the things that we've focused on that are showing up on the field of finishing and fighting and to the end and never quitting. It doesn't matter what situation comes our way. One offensive player that was inactive on Saturday was wide receiver Tavon Smith. Smith suffered a knee injury earlier in the week and head coach Kirk Ferentz said he could possibly not be back until after the bye week on October 24th. But like many times before, Iowa has gotten through this type of adversity. Inside Camp Randall Stadium, this has been Taylor Brooks for Daily Iowan TV Sports. The pressure to continue this winning streak doesn't stop. Homecoming week is upon us, and Illinois will be inside Kinnick Stadium on Saturday. Illinois just beat Nebraska in a last-second touchdown on Saturday to beat the Huskers 14-13. So you know this homecoming weekend will be an exciting one here in Iowa City. That's all we've got for you here in sports, but be sure to stick with us throughout the week for updates on all things Hawkeye Athletics. Cole and Kelsey, back to you. Hey, that's all we have for you tonight on Daily Iowan TV. Be sure to check out our website, dailyiowan.com, for all the latest news. Thanks for watching. And have a good night.